really it comes down to four things that we all do repeatedly and at the same time to build understanding or build mental models of things we're thinking about. So the first thing we're doing is we're distinguishing ideas. We're, we're making a society of people who are not thinking. And what we need is a society of people who are thinking, yeah. right? So, we're not following, not consuming information and following trends, but actually taking action based on Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Actionable ESG Talk series brought to you by AKFI Actionable Knowledge Foundational Institute, the world's first nonprofit industrial uh, consortium committed to bridging the gap between ESG sustainability and digital transformation. My name is Isabella. I am the co-host of this talk series. I'm here with my uh, another awesome co-host, Manuel, and our awesome feature guests today, Derek and Laura. Say hi, everyone. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Yes, this talk series um, brought together great minds to discuss the current state and the future state of ESG, sustainability, and digital transformation. And today, of course, we're so delighted to be here with our guest, Dr. Laura and Dr. Derek, um, they already say hi, but uh, I'm tempted to uh, give them a brave introduction again, just for you guys to know a little bit more about the guests. So Dr. Laura is an author. Hey, Laura, what, what book you wrote? <laughs> <laughs> well, we wrote Systems Thinking Made Simple. We wrote Flock Not Clock, which is about organizational design and change and leadership. We wrote Thinking at Every Desk. A lot of books. He wrote ten a few or, books, ten or before, so books before we signed up together. He wrote a few books as well. So, oh wow! Let me know the links. I, I definitely <laughs> have to check out. Yes, um, an author and an educator, well-known educator. Uh, Laura is also an evaluator, internationally recognized expert in parenting and education, and you're currently teach at Systems Thinking, uh, right, Laura? And uh, modeling and organizational design change and leadership at Cornell University. And she's also the co-founder and chief research officer at Cabrera Research Lab and acting as executive director of Think Water is a USDA funded initiative designed to implement system thinking national wide and in water based research extension and education. And turning to Derek, Derek is also an internationally well-known system uh, scientist who's uh, in 2021 got inducted as a member of the International Academy for Systems and Cybernetic Science, short for IASCYIS. And Derek is also the faculty director for the graduate certification program in systems thinking, modeling, and leaderships, and it's also a senior scientist at Cabrera Research Lab. Wow, welcome, welcome you both. Oh, and both of you are also served on the United States Military Academy at West Point System Engineering as Advisory Board. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time being here. Uh, we chat a little bit before the talk. I'm very interested in system thinking, all this kind of fundamental, uh, in-depth science. Um, so can't wait to hear everything we're going to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So, um, and to start a question, um, it, it might sound broad because I know it's a very broad, challenging kind of topic today, but I know where you know how to start uh, with the digital transformation and the topics on sustainabilities. Uh, we're actually facing uh, lots of critical social and environmental challenges. Um, so how do you see systems thinking and uh, the work you do with the research, education, contribute in addressing these kind of issues? That's a, uh, that is a broad question <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, and an important one. I mean, I think, I guess I would start equally as broad. I, I think what systems thinking broadly does is a lot of these issues are very complex. They're a web of causality. It's not a single cause that's leading to, you know, these different problems that we care about. 
Um, it's a web of causality, which means it's going to be a web of solutions. And, and what systems thinking broadly does is it kind of helps us to slow down, uh, identify the different aspects of the system, how the system's related, which perspectives are important to take, uh, how things are interrelated with each other, how, how we get unintended consequences as a result of those interrelationships. And basically, kind of slow down and, and also check our own bias, uh, the, our bias and the bias of others and, and things like that, um, so that we don't keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. Um, so while that might take a little longer, it's only, it takes longer because it's in the, in the context of if you make a mistake and it takes you a year to make that mistake and then you make it over and over again, 10 times, well, that took 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so we compare the, it, well, it takes say 10 years to figure out a systemic solution and that's longer than one year, but it's not longer than 10 years, <laughs> right? So we compare the, um, we compare the mistakes mm -hmm. to the total rather than the repetition of mistakes. And, and we don't take into account that when we repeatedly make mistakes, time is passing uh, uh w during that process i don't know if that makes sense but well i i mean i just yeah. piggyback off of that i also think what you were saying about bias that when we're when we slow down and we take a more systemic approach we recognize our own bias perspectives of others but one of the things that's the value out of doing that is we can move beyond these these um by you know bivalent or um polarized options of like it can only be this or that there's always something in the middle, right? And mm. that when we are not slowing down and looking at these cause, you know, cause webs of causality, we also talk a lot about in networks, you should focus on the lines as much as you focus on the, uh, the nodes, right? That the things that matter are sometimes in those relationships. And I think that all connects. And I think that's particularly notable in the sort of the social things that we're dealing with and the political things, the climate of everything right now feels like it's just this constant polarization. And I think to us, that's sort of the opposite of systems thinking. Yeah. I mean, I didn't mean to say that. that. <laughs> hopefully that answers. Amazing. I think you guys kind of com uh, complement each other in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we need both of you to see what say. Yes, yes. We co-teach, which is always interesting for yeah. our students. Always, way. always in, in all the interactions, I see Laura and Derek uh, yes. uh, interacting and complimenting each other. So I understand, if I can summarize, um, I think uh, you're trying to move away from a bipolar world, uh, black, white, yes, no, and, and really work on the, on the complexity and make sure that the complexity doesn't become entrenched. And in this way, we repeat the same thing again and again and again, like an old uh, record, right? Where, where it moves on the same groove again and again. That's uh, right. Is, is my understanding correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think if you look at you know, pick any complex system that we're dealing with or troubling problem. And we just keep making the same mistakes over and over again, but, the, but they look different. And the reason they look different is because they look different on the surface, on the surface, the superficial details are different, but what systems thinkers do and what systems thinking does is it gets us to not spend so much time looking at the superficial details that are on the surface and go down and look at the underlying structure. And when you look at the underlying structure of things, you see that they're actually, it's the same thing repeating. <laughs> it's a pattern that's repeating itself. But we are often fooled by the differences at the surface. And because, because it looks different at the surface, we don't realize, oh, we're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And so we don't realize that it's taking us, like I said earlier, I'm just arbitrarily picking 10 years, but we, we don't realize it's taking us 10 years. So we think, oh, this is, that was a, that was a year long mistake, but it's a year long mistake. We made 10 times. <laughs> um, so, you know, and then the reason people don't want to make a systemic solution is they go, well, that, that could take a year and a half and we don't have a year and a half. And I, and I always say, well, you, you just had 10 years. Why can't we afford a year and a half? You know? Uh, so 
obviously those times are all arbitrarily okay. chosen. Sure. But. Uh, <clears throat> in my, if I may follow up with a question uh, to both, uh, your research and, and that applied research, and this is a vast amount again that we will have a challenge to compress in a, in a few, uh, few uh, short sentences, but <clears throat> At your research at the Cabrera uh, Research Lab, uh, as far as I understand, it includes three labs, research, innovation, and impact. And if we focus on the impact lab, could you please share with us uh, how you address sustainability through your projects? Uh, the one which caught my attention is Think Water. Uh, the name is very illustrative, and I'd like to find out more details. Uh, as well as the curricula at the Santa Fe Institute, which I believe both of you uh, are part of. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I'll, I'll start it and then uh, uh, I'm sure Laura has a lot to say because <laughs> she is the reason that this pillar exists. Um, I, I think generally speaking, what, what our lab came to the realization of, uh, and it, it was actually because of a study that was done on the Cornell faculty um, called What is the Crisis? Uh, and we, where we asked them, what, what is the crisis that we face? And we did a bunch of you know, stats and things like that on their answers. But generally speaking, what we found was, um, was that there are a lot of different crises. There are a lot of different problems out there, hundreds of them. And they're all really difficult and wicked and, you know, yeah. intractable and, you know, difficult. But there's a crisis that's underlying all of those. We call it the root crisis. And that crisis is the crisis of thinking. Because if, if, if we don't think mm -hmm. in more systemic ways, then we're just going to have more and more and more of these kinds of crises. And so Laura and I sort of said to ourselves, uh, really Laura was the one that kind of brought this to, to bear, but w systems thinking can't be something that just experts are doing, you know, that, that we teach graduate students, you know, it can't be something that's only taught to graduate students. It has to be something that every person in society can understand. And so we, we spent, you know, literally a huge part of our, the last 20 or so years focused on how do we solve this root problem? And the root problem is how do you get 7 billion systems thinkers, people that can, who live in the systems and work in the systems and also think in the systems. Yeah. Um, and that's a, obviously a, a huge vision and a, a big, hairy, audacious goal. But if we don't do that, I don't think there is any other solution. Um, well, I mean, and I'll, I'll circle back to think water in one second, but I mean, I think where we landed was we took, we took your doctor research and we said, and you know, we see it in, in young kids. We said, okay, well, how would we teach these ideas to kindergartners? How would we get them to understand not what they're thinking about, but how they're thinking about the thing they're thinking about? How are they learning certain things? And we thought about it a lot and we talked about if, if a child can understand, stick with me, how they're understanding things, that's like a little backpack they can wear when they're learning math, science, English, kindergarten, first grade, graduating from high school, PhD, running a company, right? Like, so what's hard for people to first understand is those same sets of skills, we all are using them already to think. And which means if we're just aware of them, in, in other words, we're developing that metacognitious awareness of how we're thinking, then we really can get some, for lack of a better word, leverage into the kinds of things that we're thinking about over and over again and having the same solutions that aren't working over and over again, because we can change that cycle of doing the same thing repeatedly. So these four skills we teach to you know, the top CEOs in the world, we teach them to executive teams, we teach them to the top scientists in the world, and we teach them to first graders, the same exact four skills. They're just thinking um, about different things. Uh, are you referring to the DSRP? Yes. Four? Yeah. Those Would are the you, four skills of systems. For our, our audience, uh, I know it's a drop in the bucket. So we cannot promise 7 million even of audience, <laughs> but uh could you could you briefly get into that and then we can go into think water yeah 
Yeah, sure. I mean, so really it comes down to four things that we all do repeatedly and at the same time to build understanding or build mental models of things we're thinking about. So the first thing we're doing is we're distinguishing ideas. We're, we're making distinctions between and among things. Then we're also um, nesting and connecting or grouping ideas into part whole systems. Then obviously we're relating ideas. You know, we're, we're thinking about how things are related, uh, not just in a linear way, but in all of the different ways that things can be related. And we take perspective and we, and we need to make sure that we're taking multiple perspectives and multiple types of perspectives to understand ideas. So it's those four things that we're all doing all of the time to build meaning and create mental models about anything we're thinking about. Laura sometimes will say, she always uses this great example, but it's like your brain is like a, almost like think of it like your brain's like a game. Mm-hmm. And um, and it has rules, just like chess or you know monopoly or checkers tic-tac-toe or tic tac toe or, or whatever. <laughs> and the the rules are very simple, but you but the game plays those rules with each other, so they're very dynamical. So with these four things, you can do the most technical things in the world or the most basic things in the world mm-hmm. uh, because they can mix and match to create a, a nearly infinite um, rule set. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's really teaching people about their the way that they can think systemically. And this, to tie it back to, to what you originally asked about, because we kind of go on a, yeah. a, a, about think water is, you know, there's been a lot of grants for water projects, sustainability, you know, water's very important, probably, you know, more important than oil or anything else in terms of, you know, future wars and future peace and all that kind of stuff. Water is a pretty serious thing, uh, as you all know. But what what people in the, in the USDA and, and funders really were interested in is um, how can we get people to think in sustainable ways about water rather than just adopting things, right? And what I mean by that is like take recycling. We know that a lot of people recycle, actually more people recycle than we can use the recycling of. Uh, (laughs) But when we actually ask people, why do you recycle? Well, a lot of people recycle just because it's socially cool to recycle, right? Because they don't want the social stigma of not recycling. Well, think about that for a second. That's a person who is just doing something because it's a social stigma. They're not connecting their recycling behavior to a systemic understanding of the world that causes them to recycle. They're just connecting it to, well, all my friends, I'll be embarrassed if I don't recycle, so I recycle. Well, that's not creating a sustainable mindset. So what the USDA and other water experts really wanted was, how do we actually get at the thinking, not just the behavior, but the thinking that drives the behavior? Because we can always get people to do things, but the reasons that they're doing them Mm -hmm. are the difference between sustainable thinking Mm -hmm. and unsustainable thinking. Because if you have a person that's just doing things because of social ramifications, then they're always going to do it for that reason. They're never going to do it for the systemic reasons of my behaviors affect multiplied times 7 billion people affect the world. Therefore, I'm going to alter my behavior. That's the kind of thinking. So Think Water was actually developed for that purpose. Well, and just to make sure it's not confusing to the audience, think water. What's important about this is you can, you take the exist, there's great content out there to to teach about water and watersheds and potable water and the resources and the limitations, all of those things exist. So it's not that you have to get rid of any of that. So what think water was about was infusing inside of existing really good water education curricula for kids these reflective questions around being systemic in their thinking so that the kids would have a deeper connection to why do we need to conserve water? How is what I do when I brush my teeth connected to the entire world of water? So it was more about getting those, those skills inside of existing content. And I think a lot of times people think systems thinking is you just have to start from scratch and throw away everything that you have. Well, that's not true. We've seen it in K-12 schools. We see it in Think Water. It's just changing the way that we teach things with just a slight different way of inquiring, I would say. Yeah, exactly. That was a very long answer to a question. That was a long answer to a, 
but I, actually I hear uh, a theme and, and maybe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the theme is don't teach once, teach four times. Teach, teach, you know, what is the impact on the system? What is the relation between the elements of the systems? What are the distinctions, you know, uh, drinking water versus wastewater or ocean water, which you cannot drink, right? So I hear the, the <clears throat> underlining theme of the SRP may be, uh, maybe it's my bias, <laughs> but please let me know. No, I think that's right. I mean, I think I think you, you're you're teaching it over and over and over again to kind of burn the neurons to get people to start thinking structurally. And the reason that we want to do that is, and it's again, it might be a little bit of like a you got to kind of get your head around mm -hmm. it. There's what we're teaching people now, but what we know about what we're teaching people now is it won't be what they need to know sure. in the future. Right. So if, if we're not teaching them something now about how to think in the future, then they won't think in the future. Absolutely. Right? right? They won't think in the, they won't be able to solve it in the future. And we also know that these systems have a lot of unintended consequences. So we're doing things now and everybody's adopting them now, just like recycling. And everybody's doing all the same thing, you know, maybe we're buying electric, electric vehicles or, you know, whatever it is that we're all doing. And a lot of us, because for the same reason that we recycle. <laughs> but what's going to happen when, those, when, when all 7 billion of us do something and then there are unsustainable, unintended consequences of that new thing that we're doing? Right. Then we're going to have to tra tra train everybody to quickly socially adjust. And what we want to do is get people to start thinking so that we stop making these same mistakes over and over and over again. Yeah. And I think this is a time when uh, uh, we are inundated by information. As you said, this top layer of information is deafening, at least for me. It is too much, too many things happen in real time. And That's there are right. milliseconds between the event and the time I get to the, the internet. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, I, I want to mention something. As of today, Isabella is a published author. Her first oh, book is coming up. And uh, th that sends her questions about your books. Uh, and uh, <laughs> she's going to talk about the digital mind. So <laughs> very nice. That's great. Congratulations. And, uh, Thank you. Um, and going back to the, the thinking processes and so on, I can see you provide the tools the same way we learn arithmetic and basic math in, in elementary school in order to be to have access to higher math and you know higher math concepts. You, you provide the, the basics, and once the basics are there, you always can come back and, and reinforce them. Yeah. That's right. I, I actually think what you were just saying about information <laughs> is important to stop for a second and talk about that, because if you think about how much information is coming into us, but you think about how much is coming into our young people, you know, through all of the different ways that information comes to them. We have this. We talk a lot about the difference between being information full, like full of information and being knowledgeable or knowledge able. And so when I thought about, you know, you've got this actionable knowledge thing mm -hmm. happening with you. That's what we want. We want people to be, you know, have that facility with the things that they know to build knowledge that can really shape their choices and their behavior in a way rather than just be consumers of information and take it in and regurgitate it which is unfortunately what some of our That's schools exactly. and information. And, and also there is a tendency to react to trends because if you react yes. on the latest yes. information, you set a trend. Okay, uh, don't waste water, don't care about water. It's raining enough, right? And so That's right. We have enough rain. Why, why should we care about water? So the trends can move very easily from one trendsetter to another, from one influencer to another. That's right. That's right. And, you know, as a quippy little phrase, we sometimes say, we don't want to be trendy. We want to be stylish. Uh, so, you know, and there's a big difference between having style and having a, and following trends. If you're right. following trends, you're constantly just running after the newest thing that's changing and the newest thing that's being said. And that's sort of the point of the story of recycling is we don't actually want 7 billion people 
recycling because they're afraid of the social costs of not recycling, right? Like that, that's creating a, a society of people who are not thinking. And what we need is a society of people who are thinking. Yeah. Right. So, We're not following, not consuming information and following trends, but actually taking action based on thoughtful knowledge that they've built, you know, and if we don't do that, all, all the other problems won't matter. Yeah. I, I can, yeah, I can reflect what you're saying. For instance, uh, Coco Chanel dress in 1930s or so. I'm sorry, Laura, I don't know exactly the dates. <laughs> uh, uh, it's stylish. Exactly. It's timeless. It's timeless. It's timeless. It's the same with uh, uh, Derek for you, a Bugatti car. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, just to, just what you were saying made me remember. You know, um, I sometimes I sometimes wonder if people are so, um, for lack of a better word, sort of seduced by the content of what they're thinking about and how much information they're taking in that they don't actually um, have a sense of the agency that they have over their own thoughts. And yes. so it reminds me, we were at an elementary school. I'm going so to I mean, humor you with, you have to humor me story. with a story from elementary school because some of my favorite stories come out of elementary school. We were at an assembly for at a, an elementary school with kin, um, kindergartners through third graders. And we were there to talk about, we were working with their teachers around systems thinking. And we, we said, we were talking to these kids and we said, um, you know, let's talk about your thinking. And, and one of these kids said, well, okay, well, that happens in your brain. And we're like, yeah, yeah, it happens in your brain. And it's like, but it just happens, you know, like your heart beats, your brain just thinks. And we're so, well, what if actually that wasn't true? What if you actually had some power over what you think or how you're thinking? And that was just like, because I think people don't realize that with um, awareness of how you are building meaning, you can actually have a lot of agency and power over finding different solutions, thinking about things differently, being more systemic. I think sometimes we we get lost in everything that's coming at us, you know, yeah. and we just get bogged at, like you were saying, that surface level. The surface level is where we stay. But if we just go a little deeper and look at patterns and mental models, it could be different. Yeah, the idea that we can think, we don't have to think what we think. We can think something different. You know, we can change our habits. We can change. That is, uh, you know, just a profound idea. It seems obvious, you, but it's you, not. you have a, a little movie, I think, about 12 minutes, which was awarded different uh, prizes. Yes. Uh, can, you give, uh, can you give us uh, one minute about this? Because I think the title is Thinking About Thinking. Yeah, it was a movie that was done, actually. There was a, a documentary filmmaker named Deborah Horde who... Uh, who created a one hour documentary on our work in schools in particular. And we've, again, we've worked in lots of different areas, um, but she did that. She also did a 12 minute mini documentary on thinking about thinking, mm -hmm. which you can see for free on the internet. Uh, and it basically just goes through the four um, patterns, the four cognitive patterns that we mentioned, D, S, R, and P distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. And um, what, what I think is, is fun about it is, you know, it's a very short, it's a short video. And so you can get a lot very quickly. And she, she's an amazing filmmaker. Uh, filmmaker so she used all the power <laughs> of film to sort of show it. But um, the other piece I will just put out there is that there, there is a tremendous amount of research in metacognition and and behind all these simple ideas that um, that shows us that actually success in every domain is increased by metacognition. Yeah. So when we have awareness of our own thinking, which is really awareness of ourself, your success, no matter how you define success, money, family, you know whatever it is that you define success, more Emmys, more whatever it is that you're mm -hmm. defining as success will increase with metacognition. Yeah. So that's pretty powerful research if, 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 to understand that just becoming more aware of your own thinking well, is one of the key indicators of success. 
Yes. And also, you know, the one thing that I think is really profound about that 12 minute video is it illustrates an idea that we talk about a lot, which is people think systems thinking is for big, complicated, intractable problems. Only the, you know, the greatest minds are supposed to be doing. And what her film actually shows is systems thinking is something that happens in every day, every day, everyday problems, everyday every interactions. Like we literally had a a five minute system thinking conversation to change the way we feed our dogs. We have four massive dogs and the chaos that ensued, we sort of <laughs> took a moment and we said, okay, let's think about this a little differently and be more systemic and came up with a new way of thinking about it. So I don't want people to think that system thinking is something that professors and universities do or consultants at big companies or whoever. System thinking is something everybody does. And we can, we can think about anything systemically because we exist in systems, right? And and I want it to be really accessible. I want people to really know that it's something that they can leverage and use for anything they're thinking about. And, you know, it ties back to the whole, you know, ESG thing, like all of those things that are part of environmental and social and governance, all of those things um, are things that we can use systems thinking to better understand and connect and yep. I, I wanted to add something because I'm using actually DSRP, maybe not according to the user's manual, but you'll tell me <laughs> now. Uh, it is a powerful communication tool. And when you talk about ESG, when you talk is especially about sustainability, which is a change of the culture, when you change, uh, change the digital transformation culture of a company, communications is the most coveted uh, skill an executive has to have. <clears throat> it's not so much about knowledge because knowledge is sort of forward. We don't know, as, as Derek mentioned, the unintended consequences of PSG or sustainability. We'll have to discover them. <clears throat> but an executive has, and, and I see this, I won't call it a bridge, I'll call it a highway to communicating to the uh, rest of the people, because if they do not share the same mindset, mm -hmm. and this is sort of what it gets blamed, people don't have the same mindset, then it's very difficult to, you, you, you hear the words, you may repeat the words, we have a good memory, but you do not uh, put them in what you call metacognition, you don't make them knowledge, you're making them just repeated words, okay, ESG, yeah. ESG, uh, environment, and so on. Yeah. Is it my understanding correct? That is correct. And I think I, I think it's, you know, it's very deeply embedded in our society because we're teaching our children to be this way. And so it's no, it's no mystery that adults end up this way, which is if we test people based on their ability to regurgitate information in school, not based on their ability to, to take information and make it meaningful so that they can do something with it, actionable, um, you know, knowledge able versus information full. And then when those kids become adults, that we do the same thing in our businesses, right? So we go, oh, we have a vision. Can you say the vision? Oh, yeah, <laughs> everybody can repeat the vision. Great. That means we all share the same vision. No, it doesn't, because it matters what the mental model, the meaning that you put into that thing is, right? And so our book, Flog Not Clock, is all about this. It's a it's about how do you manage organizations as a systems leader and how do you change culture? And it's all about sh getting a shared mental model, which means you have to be clear about what the mental model is. And then you have to share the mental model, not share it like you share a PDF through email. That doesn't mean it's shared. Right. That's sharing information. I can share a PDF full of information with 10,000 people in one second. That doesn't mean 10,000 people share the same mental model. Mm -hmm. That means 10,000 people got an email with an attachment. And probably didn't. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> and there's a big difference between those two things. If you have 10,000 people that all share the same mental model, yeah. that is a powerful force. If you have 10,000 people that have all been informed of the same thing, that's nothing. Right. <laughs> they can they can recite the uh, the vision as a you know as a motto of uh, belonging to the group sort of right That's the right. secret code. That's right. But I want you to sh you know the reason we do this is because we've been taught to do this in school. 
You know, sure. I, I, we, this is what we're doing to kids all day long, all day long. We're, we're giving them information and then they parrot it back to us. And, and test it, test it if they yeah. can memorize it or they exactly. can manipulate it. Uh, we give Even them, in a society where we have Google and all that information is readily available, right? And free. So sure. you can type in what's the capital of Texas. You can type in what, you know, how many people live in Paris. You don't need to know that stuff. I can Google it in seconds. Yeah. But systems thinking gives us a language for the structure of the way we're thinking. And we see that, you know, we're with executive groups and they're like, all of a sudden their conversations have shifted. They're yeah. talking about their mental <laughs> models. They're talking about the difference between their mental models in groups and how to come to a shared mental model. So they're thinking about, hey, you're making a different distinction. Something that you're saying means something that I'm saying. You know, we're saying the same word, but we mean different things. So let's figure out what do we mean by this word and how are we going to act upon that meaning, right? So I think you're right. The language is important, being able to communicate, not just at that surface level, but what we actually mean in terms of the structural mental model underneath things. And, uh, I don't know if you speak multiple languages, but I, uh, Isabella and I, we do. And I think it's, it's almost a meta language. <clears throat> I think it you is. don't need to translate it in, uh, you know, <clears throat> the way you translate a piece of literature, right? From French to English or where, where you have this uh, difficulty to, to, to take a word from one language and put it in another. I think it's more That's of a right. meta, it's yeah. a basic communication tool. And, and that goes back to leadership. And, and uh, uh, well, I'm also watching the, the, the clock and I think <laughs> I'll turn it to Isabella. Uh, be <laughs> but before I do that, one more thing. Can you send us a big, uh, a little uh, easy to use uh, bibliography for our audience. Our audience is, sure. is very varied. Uh, there are from executives to uh, young managers or even students. Uh, so uh, something that it's easy for them to understand and use. I, I, I stress use, I stress action. <laughs> yeah. That's right. No, I think that's, that's critical. I th um, and we can send you that. If you go to our website at cabrerresearch.org that has a lot of stuff on it that's free to download the video that you talked about, uh, little little five five questions that you can ask yourself over and over and over again, and some other things like the you know the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report. If you look at that, you look at the the list of top ten skills that you know we know are going to be needed in the future. All ten of them are about thinking. Mm -hmm. you Absolutely, know? all ten of them. <laughs> are about thinking, systems analysis, creativity, analytical thinking, creativity, originality, uh, you know, critical thinking and analysis, complex problem solving. It's all underneath all of those things is the ability to make distinctions in a sophisticated way, group things in a way that works, understand how the interrelationships work and take perspectives. If you look at ESG itself, I mean, ESG is just three perspectives on a system yeah. that we didn't used to take, yeah. right? Exactly. We used to take one perspective, which was shareholder value. Now we take four perspectives, which is, you know, uh, the shareholder value plus ESG or, or maybe shareholders part of the G. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it, it's just literally taking more perspectives on organizations and you get ESG. And then if you break down, well, what is the environmental piece? What's the social piece? What's the governance piece? Well, those are just part whole systems, right? Environmental has climate change, you know, biodiversity, carbon intensity, you know, blah, blah, blah. What does governance have? That's a part whole system. What does social have? That's a part whole system. And it matters what's which, which things you're distinguishing in that part whole system, right? Absolutely. What, what is your list? Is your list different than her list? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So... It really is just a fundamental set of skills that that we use over and over and over again in everything that we do and think. Yeah, uh, Derek can can be <laughs> more the one the right. The 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 I haven't verified, but there are about 160 lists of what ESG means. That, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a, a prediction that DSRP would make. 
Yeah. <laughs> right? Because everybody's yep. got a slightly different perspective on <laughs> these perspectives and what the different things mean. What are we going to distinguish as part of those things? How are those things related? And so you end up with uh, diversity. Now, you know, what somebody will do eventually is they'll look across that diversity and try to figure out some kind of universality. And, and we do this, you know, in every single discipline, in every single field, we see DSRP happening. Uh, it's just kind of universal to the way knowledge evolves. Right. I, I won't disclose more about uh, uh, about Isabella's book, but she's approaching it from a different perspective. And the perspective is how much the machine versus human brain can work together as opposed to compete one with the other or you know, if we believe in, in apocalyptic movies, destroy. Yes. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, funny. neat. Very nice. Well, that's uh, the beauty of perspective is you can look at you can look at the same system from a, a a million different perspectives and see something completely different. Yeah. The diversity. I wouldn't say I take a different approach. I, I was very carefully listening to everything you guys are sharing today. Fundamentally, I think we're working on the same goal is to find the, the role of being a human. Like, what does it mean for us to be a human on this planet? And everything you share, everything you guys are doing, I think it's very critical and fundamental. That also means difficult, challenging, because it's not something we can see result like from the surface. You're working <laughs> under the deep roots. You're trying to figure out that deep meaning of being human. That's what I really see you guys are, are doing. And that's really encouraging. And uh, I, I also agree history repeats. And now I found the reason it repeats because we're repeating the same mistake. It's not, <laughs> there's a pattern we're repeating. <laughs> pattern. That's right. Yeah, and that comes because we don't focus on the deep, the deep roots. We're always focused on the surface, as Laura mentioned, with the overloaded information. We're so distracted. There's no attention to to find a deep system thinking uh, way of being human. That's yeah. right. Yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, I, I'm watching the clock again. Uh, so, uh, Isabella, would you have a final question? <laughs> or comment so obvious, but well obviously i have one if you ask <laughs> yes we do have a, a great question on uh, to prepare for to close our talk mm, uh congratulations uh i heard that you recently uh complete a very a successful 20 i wasn't there 2022 cornell university international system thinking conference Yes. We did. It was the largest, right. uh, largest systems thinking conference in the world, uh, which uh, was, you know, a, a great surprise wow. and, and also just a <laughs> testament to our, the students that we have that organized it. And uh, so we were very proud of that. Yes. Sounds fantastic. And uh, I know AKFI was also a part of it as a sponsor. Part of it, yeah. Yeah, that was so fun. And then the topic, uh, one of the topics at the agenda was uh, sustainability case studies in agent-based approach. Uh, can you share some thoughts about the conference in general? Uh, you, you kind of mentioned already, and this particularly on this panel as well. Yeah, sure. So we were really lucky to have, um, well, we had a variety of panels because we really wanted to illustrate the fact that you know systems thinking is sort of content agnostic it can it, it yields its power in any anything that you're thinking about but we had one panel on sustainability we had three great speakers matt chatsey jeff sokolow and Annalie wilson each of which are working on esg or sustainability very specifically and what i think they really were able to show across their topics because they were very different Annalie is the sustainability officer for chipotle the restaurant matt has his own um uh consulting firm where he works with FEMA and other types of organizations non around, ventures. Yeah, uh, around um, sustainable, you know, taking a, 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 a natural resources approach to solutions and, and finding solutions that work with the environment. And um, Jess also works on ESG, but she works in a consulting firm uh, working with big companies on how to increase their uh, social responsibility and things. But what they were, what we saw across them is they really were able to take 
take what we were talking about, which is think about, you know, those webs of causality, focus on the relationships between and among the things that people usually think about disparately and, and come to some ideas about how we can take a totally different perspective including those relationships on any system we're thinking about. I mean, I don't know what you were thinking. Yeah, and I, I would just add one thing to that part of what we talked about. A big focus of this year's conference was what was called an agent-based approach yep, or what right. we call ABA. Now, there's uh, this is one of those things we could spend, you know, hours <laughs> and hours and hours talking about. But the, the, in a nutshell, what that means is that most of the systems that we're that we are all interested in, all, all of your viewers and, and all of us here mm -hmm. are what scientists would call a complex adaptive system. And if you understand the background of complex adaptive systems, you understand that they have agents and those agents are following simple rules. If you don't understand that, that's okay, but then, mm -hmm. that's for more discussion later. <laughs> so we because of that, you need what we call an agent-based approach, which analyzes the system from the perspective of what are the agents doing that multiplied by all the agents in the system lead to what, what happens. The and often what happens is something we don't like, right? Like pollution or, you know, uh, environmental degradation or social degradation or, you know, some kind of some, some kind of wicked problem. And the reason that that problem is existing is because you take one person and they do one thing a certain way, and then you multiply that times 10 billion, you know, 10 million people or 10,000 people or whatever it is, whatever large number um, up to seven and a half billion, and you get these emergent effects. And so an agent-based approach is an approach where we kind of look at, okay, if the agents doing these things and multiplied leads to these big wicked problems, then the wicked solutions are going to also be agent-based. Right. They're not going to be top-down. They're going to be agent-based multiplier effects. So just in a nutshell, what we were, th what, and we've been, we've been working on this for a few years, we've been teaching our graduate students. The idea is we wanted to have an analytical approach that met the complexity of the problems because it's based in the science of systems, in, yeah. the, in the idea that, you know, we have these these complex systems. We have to look at the agent behavior to actually get some. That's probably a, a mile, that's not like drinking I, from a fire. I, I <laughs> hear I hear the next uh, conference will have together. The next event will have together will be about ABA because I want to do justice and the, and there are many examples of ABA yes. um, functions. I remember your flock of birds model. Yes, yeah. exactly. And if you so, go to concepts, con uh, if you go to Cornell.Systems, that's the conference web page. And when the videos are up, they'll be posted there. So if you yeah, we'll receive a copy and yeah, we'll receive a copy and we'll distribute it as soon as we get it. I understand we'll be in the yeah. middle of, uh, of uh, June. Middle of June, we should get the uh, videos out. I, yeah. I, I'll gladly spend another hour, but I'm watching your clock, not mine. Yes, unfortunately. Uh, we I another. want to give Isabella one more minute for a closing remark, if, uh, if we may. All right, let's do this. This conversation is definitely for days. Sorry, guys, we have to end it today, our dear audience. We'd love to have Derek and Laura back to continue on this meaningful topic. Thank you so much, Derek and Laura, for taking the time joining us today. And thank you thank to you. all of you for tuning in. Make sure to join us every week for a new episode of AKFI's actionable ESG talk series. You gain new perspective on how to mitigate risks and create real value by integrating ESG and digital transformation. Until the next one, goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, y'all.